Okay, I'd like to thank um, everyone for, for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Linda. I'm with the Upper Saddle River Library. Um, as you heard with saying recording, we will be recording this program. Uh, we'll be posting it to the Upper Saddle River Library YouTube page. I'll send a follow-up email with the link for it. So for if you guys wanna take notes during the program or not, um, it, it, that's up to you, but you will be able to reference it back to it. Also, I'll be monitoring the chat during the program. Uh, so if you wanna put, if you have a question, uh, we'll hold questions to the end, but if, if you have a question, um, I will be monitoring the chat um, and, and, and you can put it in there if, if you have it when you think of it. So with that, um, I'd like to say a big welcome to, she said I could say Dr. Z, but I'm gonna go with Dr. Sablansky. Uh, she's a board, board certified dermatologist affiliated with the Valley Hospital. Um, her practice is focused on general medicine, surgical, and cosmetic dermatology. She received her medical degree from the University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine. She went on to complete her residency at, at Cornell Medical College, where she was chief resident of the program during her final year. And she is going to share with us some of her favorite skin care tricks, which I'm very excited for. So with that, I'm gonna mute myself as well and let Dr. Z take it away. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Just, yeah, and you can see my screen, right? As I click, uh, let's see. Yes, the clicking is working. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, so, um, as stated, we're going to be talking about sort of like my top 10 skincare tips. Um, I'm a dermatologist with the Valley Medical Group. My office is in Ridgewood, and these are some of the things that I am just talking about on a daily basis. So, um, I, we will take it from there. Um, here's the full list, um, that we will go through and starting with number one. Let's see if I can move this screen so that I can see. Okay. So anybody that knows me knows that I am a huge proponent of sunscreen. It is um, sort of the number one anti-aging, most important thing that you can do to protect your skin. We know that exposure to UV radiation causes skin cancer. And we also know that sun damage is the number one cause of wrinkles and discoloration. So um, sunscreen is, is a huge tool um, in the armamentarium to protect yourself from um, both of these elements. And while we sort of knew this anecdotally in the past, um, in recent years, we actually have some you know, hard and fast data that proves to us that regular sunscreen use prevents aging, prevents skin cancer. And by regular use, it means sort of like a, you know, a moisturizer with sunscreen on the face. Um, and the most famous uh, example of this is um, this truck driver that was um, published in 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And he walked into a clinic and was just considered to be such a perfect example of, you know, what the sun can do. It was, he was like a science experiment. As you can see the left side of his face look significantly older than the right side. And that's because for so many years he drove um, with that side of his face, you know, being exposed. Um, and I have a few more examples just because a picture does speak a thousand words. These are twins, twin sisters who are obviously exactly the same age. Um, and it's pretty obvious which one actually looks older and is, you know, has been a little bit more exposed to the elements over the course of her life, you know, the, the blotchiness, the discoloration, many more fine lines and wrinkles. She, um, you know, spent most of her life living in Florida, the one on my right. I'm not sure where you guys might be seeing it, but the other twin, um, you know, lived in Ohio, didn't get as much sun. And so this is another sort of like perfect science experiment because we know that genetically these sisters are exactly the same. The last um, you know, point I will make to sort of drive home you know, uh, the evidence for sunscreen is that this is a woman who was published. She, she was um, 
a receptionist uh, and she sat near a window. So for the duration of her career and this, the purpose of this slide I love because it makes the point that UVA rays actually penetrate glass. So this is sort of my logic for why I think everyone should put a little sunscreen on in the morning, you know, wake up, brush teeth, wash your face and throw a little sunscreen on because even if you're not leaving the house, if you're spending time indoors near windows, um, you know, this is the side A is the side of her face that was exposed to the window. Um, and side B is the side where she, you know, was not facing the window. So, you know, just driving home the point that um, the, the, the rays are strong and UVA is actually the, the rays that cause wrinkling. So um, important to always wear sunscreen. Um, as I've said, you know, wear sunscreen every single day even on, you know, days that are not obviously sunny. Um, so, you know, it, the, the rays can come through the clouds. You wanna put on a lot of it. I usually say that the sunscreen that is in makeup is not enough to rely on. I love tinted moisturizers um, as sort of a way to supplement the moisturizer with sunscreen that you have on underneath. But I do think that sometimes women who rely on it is, oh, it's in my makeup. You know, unless you're putting on like a thick goopy layer of makeup every day, then it's probably not enough sunscreen. So, um, you know, the sort of buzzword you want to look for on your product is something that says broad spectrum and it should be SPF 30 or higher. The ingredients in sunscreens have come sort of like under discussion in recent years. Um, so I do like to talk just a little bit about that because I tend to get questions. Um, just to sort of break it down, we have the chemical sunscreens, which are in green. We have the mineral sunscreens, which are in blue. Um, the chemical sunscreens, you know, have not been proven to really do any kind of harm. However, they can be irritating to people who have sensitive skin. So the easiest thing to do is just look for a sunscreen with zinc oxide. Um, that's going to be broad spectrum. It's the only ingredient you need. Um, and if you, you know, you look for a mineral sunscreen that has zinc oxide, even if you have sensitive skin, you should be able to tolerate it. Uh, and, you know, the labeling of the sunscreen bottles um, was changed in 2011, actually making it easier. Uh, really, you just have to look where I've circled on this slide at the active ingredients. And that's going to tell you, are they chemical? Are they mineral? You know, again, the easiest thing to look for is if you're sensitive, it should only say zinc oxide up here. Um, some of the chemical sunscreens are nice because they're a little easier to rub in. So, um, you know, it, it, if you see a combination of those and you're, you tolerate them fine, then it's okay to use those too. Um, the I circled again here, the broad spectrum SPF 15 because the FDA did state that if it's broad spectrum, it has to say so. So they've just, they've really made it easy in that regard. Here's a couple of my favorites. Um, Neutrogena, most of their sunscreens are great for, you know, days when you're at the beach or the pool and don't mind putting something goopy, but they do have a couple of sunscreens called Healthy Defense, which are great because they're daily moisturizers, SPF 50, 50, and um, they have a mineral option and a chemical option. So the sensitive skin one is mineral, the other one is chemical, easy peasy. I do love sort of, you know, on a higher end, higher price point product, the ISDIN, um, which is um, a brand that is broad spectrum SPF 50 also. It's mineral, it's extremely lightweight, just rubs in really nicely. Um, and I am a big lover of the tinted mineral products. Um, I do tend to turn towards the makeup lines for those a little bit more because they provide a wide range of colors. Whereas in the drugstore, maybe you're going to have a tinted product and it's just like one medium shade. Um, for example, this Ilia product um, here, you know, it's, it's, it's a mineral, it's SPF 40, and it comes in a variety of colors. Um, this example up here is for people who want a little more coverage. If you'd like something more foundation-y, um, the brand is called It Cosmetics, also initially started in conjunction with physicians. So mineral SPF 50. 
Um, and then lastly, they have all kinds of sunscreen products available now. I love this brush on block product, which is great for reapplication throughout the day. So in the hot summer, your bottle of sunscreen might get like greasy or too hot in the car. You can always have a powdered sunscreen to throw on throughout the day if you're, you know, realize you're going to be exposed. Ultimately, it's great to have tons of options, but the most important thing is that the best sunscreen is the one that you will use. Because if you're like me, if I don't like a product, I don't like the way it feels, it's not convenient, I'm just not going to be good about using it. So, um, you know, it's the, the nice thing about there being so many options out there. Sorry, I have, I have a upstairs. <laughs> um, stow away here. Um, so the, the nice thing about having so many options is that, um, you know, you can find something that works for you, regardless of what that may be. Okay, moving on to, um, you know, sun protective clothing. I think that sun protective clothing is part of the sun protection plan. Um, another, you know, um, having lots of options helps me not feel like I have to like gob up my whole body with sunscreen. So I might apply it and, you know, go to the beach with my kids, go to the pool, put on my sunscreen in the morning, you know, and then I feel a little lazy. I don't want to reapply. It's nice to have a UPF 50 rated product that I can throw on, you know, after I've sunscreened them and, um, you know, be covered, feel protected. It's also become trendy to do so. So, um, you know, it's all over the magazine, covering up these, you know, huge hats and all that kind of stuff. So lots of options out there. And I sort of consider it all working together because if you have options, then you'll feel more motivated, you know, to protect yourself. I promise I will stop talking about the sun soon. Um, so moving on to number three, this is something that I get asked about a lot. You know, what about retinoids? What about these vitamin A products that, um, you know, are going to make me look so much younger? Um, there's a lot of products out there now, uh, which is great. So, um, you know, it's important to know a little bit about how each one works so that you can choose the, the one that works right for you. The way that retinoids work is that they, exfoliate the skin. And we have data now that shows that they increase collagen, they can minimize fine lines, even out skin tone over time. Of course, this is with chronic use. Um, and, uh, you know, using them properly. So the over-the-counter products are the retinol, the retinol palmitate, retinaldehyde, and adapalene. And this is my favorite addition, the adapalene because um, it's now available over the counter. It used to be by prescription. The prescription ones that are available are still the tretinoin, the adapalene, the tazaratine, and triferritine. So um, those ones you will need a, um, a prescription from your dermatologist or your physician. So the way to properly use these is to um, proceed with caution. You wanna use them at night, for the most part, dappling can be used during the day. Um, you want to use a small amount. You, know, you want to sort of be aware that they can be a little irritating at first and that you need to build the tolerance um, to you know, the product so that you can keep with it. My favorite entry level products are um, this Differin or the Adapalene that has recently been, you know, in recent years, been made available over the counter. And then another product, which is, um, which has retinol in it, which is a, a, it's like a retinol, but it's more gentle. It's not so irritating. So, um, and here's, here's the, a couple examples. So I don't know if you can, I, you can see my arrow, I think. Um, you can see here that Differin, which you may be familiar with as an acne product that was available um, by prescription in the past is now available. Um, over the counter, the active ingredient is Adapalene gel. And you can even find like generic CVS brand Adapalene gel available in the acne care section of the drugstore. Um, but it is the same exact product that we use for, um, 
you know, wrinkles, fine lines, that sort of thing. So it's easy peasy to find. It's not as irritating as the stronger prescription retinoids, um, but it definitely works better than the retinols that are out there. Um, so, you know, with the knowledge that it could be a little irritating, you can start like once or twice a week and sort of see how your skin responds. Some people will be able to immediately work up to every night. Others will come back and tell me, listen, I can only do this twice a week because I get really sensitive. And so I say, that's great. You know, maybe for you, that's as much as you're gonna use it. Um, the, the, this product by Aven, which is a Retch Renau, is even more gentle than a Dapoline. So, um, but it's actually a little more expensive. So this, you know, this Adapalene that's available now um, over the counter is really, really a game changer just in terms of accessibility. I, um, I love it. Just to say, there was a question in the chat um, about if you can use the, the retinoids on the neck and also on the back, maybe for acne. So what I-, I Sure, just... sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for acne, yes, we use the retinoids on the back, of course. Um, but same, same deal, proceed with caution. It can be irritating, especially on the back. It's kind of if somebody has a large area that they you know, need to treat acne. Um, you, you maybe wanna mix it with a moisturizer just so that it spreads more easily. Um, for sure, I do that for my acne patients. For the neck, in terms of anti-aging, um, the neck and chest are much, much more sensitive than the face. And that's because we have more oil glands on the face. So, you know, people that maybe can tolerate a retinoid on their face three times a week, they try putting it on their neck, and they'll come in with a rash. They'll get red, they'll get peely. So maybe, you know, the neck, it can only be tolerated once, twice a week. You have to be a little bit more careful. Um, and also it's important to remember that if you're putting on retinol at night, retinoids at night, you should be, you know, putting on sunscreen in the morning. Um, and maybe not everybody sunscreens, you know, their neck well, you know, we're all, most of us who are in the routine can be good about sunscreen in our faces, you know, spreading it down, um, especially if you're using a retinol is important. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, okay, moving on to number four, antioxidants are um, sort of buzzy lately, and we do have um, data that they can be helpful. Um, you know, what do antioxidants do? Antioxidants are things like vitamin C, vitamin E, um, and uh, they are, um, you know, everybody sort of has known that green tea and red wine and all these, you know, products that have antioxidants are good for us in certain ways. Why is that? It's because um, the environment and pollution and all that um, creates what are called these free radicals that cause cell damage and that cell damage, you know, then leads to wrinkles, fine lines, et cetera. So the antioxidants kind of block these free radicals. I have a nice infographic here. So if you imagine that your healthy cell, which is purple, you know, is, you know, happily hanging out, this free radical is trying to damage it. The antioxidant sort of kind of stops up all of those free radicals. Um, and we have lots of studies that show that they can help you know, in different ways. So the question is, you know, how do we get to them? And, you know, again, lots of, lots of us are familiar that, you know, healthy diet, you know, fruits and vegetables, um, things I mentioned, green tea, red wine, if that's your um, preference, um, you know, is good in many ways. So does it work to put them on the skin from the outside in? And the answer is yes. Um, but that there is some variability out there in terms of the products. Um, and like with a lot of the things I already mentioned, it's nice that there's ubiquity, you know, there's a whole bunch of products available now, but that means it's important to know what you're selecting and why you're selecting it. So for example, um, you know, there's different forms of vitamin C because vitamin C is a very unstable antioxidant. The minute it gets exposed to some air, it can be damaged. Um, so there's ascorbic acid, and then there is this tetrahexyl decyl ascorbate or THD ascorbate, which is sort of a next level, more stable vitamin C. If you can find and afford a product that has THD ascorbate, 
you know, it can work a little bit better than the regular ascorbic acid. Um, if you have a product that has ascorbic acid in it, that's not a problem, but it does mean that it will, it, you know, will oxidize more quickly. Um, you know, if you notice that you have something that was sort of like a clear to yellow gel and, you know, you're halfway through the tube or the end of the tube and it's starting to look brown, that means it's oxidizing and it's not doing so much when you put on your face, it's just time to replace it. Um, so if you can choose opaque tubes, air restrictive bottles, you know, pumps, things that, you know, protect it against the air and light, then that's, then that's a good idea. Here's one option here um, that SkinCeuticals makes. Um, you know, as you can see, it's like a brown glass bottle and that is to protect the vitamin C. I have a couple of examples here um, that are great. Um, as I said, different price points. L'Oreal has this Revitalift, it's 10% vitamin C. CeraVe has a similar product. Both the L'Oreal and the CeraVe product are great entry-level vitamin Cs. Um, if you notice it starts to oxidize, you go out, you get a new tube. Um, this, I really like the, uh, this pump that Paula's Choice makes, um, because it's like, you know, totally sealed in there. There's no air that, you know, gets into your product. You just pump out what you're going to use. Um, La Roche-Posay has a really nice vitamin C serum and the way they stabilize it is not just with, um, an opaque bottle, but it's in salicylic acid. So, you know, important to read the bottle and notice that salicylic acid can be a little irritating. You know, we use salicylic acid in oily acne prone skin. So this is a great product, but if you're a little dry, you know, you want to stay away from things like this. Peter Thomas Roth, this product, you know, it's got the THD ascorbate in it. I don't know if you guys can see this, but the THD ascorbate is actually listed on you know, the tube. So, um, and Re Revision Skin Care's vitamin C lotion also has that THD ascorbate. So they're a little more pricey. Everybody sort of picks and chooses where they want to spend on their skincare. Um, in some situations, I think it's worth it to spend on these types of products. You know, I don't think you need an expensive cleanser or moisturizer. Um, you sort of balance your regimen depending on what, you know, what your preferences are. This is SkinCeuticals product is also kind of like on the upper end of the spectrum. Um, and it does also have this um, filamarin, which is like um, salicylic acid. So it can be a little bit drying. But these, at the end of the day, these are all great products. So, um, and, and these go on in the morning underneath your sunscreen to protect against sort of the antioxidants that you're going to encounter throughout the day. Okay. I'm sort of switching gears here a little bit. What I talked about for now, you know, is really um, sort of focusing a little bit on um, skin cancer and aesthetics and, you know, keep having a good skincare regimen. These are going to be sort of just random tips and tri tricks that my patients, you know, sort of love um, that I talk about on the daily base on a daily basis. Um, so what do we do when we get a cut or a scrape? You know, there's lots of options out there, including antibiotic ointment. Should I put a Band-Aid on it? Should I let it out to the air? And we have lots of data now that states that moist heals better than dry. So you end up with less of a scar, less pain. If you keep a wound moist and mushy, honestly, is what I tell people, the mushier, the better. And um, it's counterintuitive. My patients will tell me, but I need to form a scab so that it dries and heals. And I'm like, yeah, if, they, if you do that, it will heal more quickly, but you'll have more of a scar at the end. Um, and so keeping, you know, some Vaseline and a bandage or gauze and paper tape on it, um, you know, is, is, is the best way and changing it once daily. It's okay for wounds to get, you know, wet soap and water in the shower is a good idea and changing it with Vaseline and a Band-Aid. Um, in my house, sort of like Vaseline is our Windex, you know, we Vaseline on everything. <laughs> um, so, and this is just sort of fun. I loved seeing that Band-Aid brand now has all different colored Band-Aids. I thought that was fun, you know? So it makes it easy for everybody to um, keep Band-Aids on their wounds for a long period of time. Um, and, and, and then I'll, you know, when I say this Vaseline bit, then my patients will be like, well, what, what about Neosporin? Should I put Neosporin on my, and I, um, Neosporin is actually not necessary and can do more harm than good. So there's 
a decent percentage of the population that's actually allergic to neosporin. And so when you have a wound that's healing and you start putting neosporin on it and you get an allergic reaction that gets more red and itchy, it, um, it's actually just gonna harm the healing process. So if something is not infected, it does not need an antibiotic ointment. If you are a lover of antibiotic ointments and really wanna put you know, antibiotic ointment on something, or if you feel like it's infected and wanna use something you know, until you can get in to see your, your, your doctor, um, polysporin is better than neosporin. And that's just because polysporin has two ingredients, neosporin has three, and the neomycin in neosporin is the one that's the problem. So um, polysporin is much less allergenic than neosporin. Um, some of my patients, you know, ask me about, you know, CeraVe or Aquaphor ointments, and I'm totally okay with those. They're basically just fancy Vaseline. So um, I'm good with, you know, any of the things you see on the screen right now. Um, I actually really love CeraVe's healing ointment because it has some extra moisturizers in it. Um, and it's, it doesn't have lanolin in it, which Aquaphor does. Very rarely people can be sensitive to that. So, you know, at the end of the day, any of these, if people have, you know, little kids and they're changing diapers and they happen to have a tub of Aquaphor around, like, it's fine to use that too. Oh, okay. And these are big no-nos. I'll go back because you can't really see that. But, you know, there's no need to put rubbing alcohol on wounds. There is no need to put hydrogen peroxide on wounds. Hydrogen peroxide is okay immediately after. Like if you get a scrape and you worry that, you know, there's dirt, it was dirty, you can clean it once with hydrogen peroxide and then, you know, start the Vaseline um, and Band-Aid regimen. Um, but if you repeatedly clean a wound with hydrogen peroxide, it will not only kill, you know, in, you know, um, infected type cells, but it kills healthy tissue too. So, um, so you actually don't need to clean anything with hydrogen peroxide. And just continuing um, the discussion about wound care, um, you know, it, in terms of, okay, what my, my wound has healed, I got this scratch, now I have, you know, a scar, and what can I do about it? Um, in terms of data supporting, you know, scar healing, the only thing that has good data behind it are the silicone containing products. Um, the original Mederma product, which was an um, onion-based ointment, um, vitamin E oil, which can be allergenic as well. This is sort of one of my no-nos because it doesn't help and it can just cause an allergy. Um, none of those really sort of held up. They did a big study where they compared all of those and straight Vaseline beat out all of those other topicals. The only thing that was even better is that once something is healed, um, silicone gel can be helpful or the silicone scar sheets. So depending on where the you know, scar is, um, obviously like on the face, it's hard to wear, you know, if you have or an area, you know, that's cosmetically unacceptable to wear a silicone strip, you can use the gel. Um, but the strips are great for like hidden areas. Um, I have, you know, it's, um, some of my female patients who have C-sections and then end up with like slightly lumpy, bumpy C-section scars. They have special silicone strips now that are in the shape of C-section scars. Um, and they're really easy to wear. You just put them on, wear them all day, take a shower and then slap them back on. Um, and you can use this for new scars, old scars. You know, the data shows that it helps. And the way that this helps is that the silicone sort of massages um, the skin microscopically. Okay, this is another one of my like loved, loved elements that I talk about with my patients. Um, you know, compression stockings, get lots of questions about varicose veins. What can I do? I keep getting more, this, that. I don't wanna do procedures. Um, of course, if you have big veins and you know, maybe you need a vascular surgeon to treat them for you, that's one thing. But wearing compression stockings or socks is a great easy peasy way to prevent and treat, you know, prevent from getting more once you already have um, varicose veins, they can, you know, prevent your lower legs from swelling too much. And, um, you know, if you have too much swelling, you can end up with itchy rashes on the legs. It's something called stasis dermatitis. And um, 
but one of the main treatments for that is I'm treating your rash, but I'm also really twisting your arm that you got to start wearing compression stockings to prevent all of this from coming back. Um, and, and, and there's lots of options out there. Um, you know, it used to be that they were all ugly, uncomfortable, looked like women's pantyhose, you know, one color sort of thing. And now it's, it's just become popular. You know, athletes are wearing these even during their training. Um, they're wearing them post-training. And, and because of that, there's options everywhere. Amazon, I think these ones come from Amazon. These are ones that I wear. Um, they have ones with zippers that makes it easy to get them on. They have toeless ones so that your toes don't get sweaty. Um, all kinds of stuff. So huge, huge thing that I love um, to sort of harp on compression. Um, continuing to move down the leg a little bit. Um, another question that I get is, you know, what can I do about my thick calloused skin on my feet? And um, the key with, with this is to look for active ingredients. So, you know, moisturizers are great. Of course, moisturizers are great. But what you want to look for is products that are going to help cure the problem. And um, urea is a humectant meaning um, it draws water into, you know, like attracts water. So um, urea is a great, you know, um, ingredient that's going to help this skin, you know, become more soft. And a lot of times urea is combined with something called lactic acid, which lactic acid is an exfoliant and it's going to help get rid of the dead skin cells. So some combination of this, you know, is usually helpful. And you basically put it on at night, you occlude it, you put a sock on over it and, you know, do it regularly until you get to a point where you're happy and then maybe do it as maintenance, but, you know, once a week, a couple times a week. Um, it is important to sun protect, like sometimes these acid products can make you a little sensitive to the sun, not so much that people are maybe exposing their feet to the sun, but it's just something to think about. Um, Eucerin came out with a really nice line, their roughness relief line. Um, that has both a lotion and then a cream, which are good to kind of put all over, and then a more concentrated spot treatment, um, which is like 10 bucks. It's really not expensive. That's great for like elbows, you know, the thicker areas, areas where you might have specific calluses. I haven't added it to my presentation yet, um, but I recently came across a Dr. Scholl's product. They also make a really nice um, kind of you know, cream products that include some of these ingredients. They have a blue one and a green one. I think it was a green one that had, um, you know, some, uh, some nice concentration of these ingredients. So there's starting to be a little bit more variety, you know, for this out there. Okay, um, moving, swinging kind of back around from exfoliating the dead skin on our feet to do we need to exfoliate the skin on our faces or on other parts of the body? Um, and there's, there's a couple tidbits here that are important. Number one is that there is no role for, you know, physical exfoliation. The sort of arch nemesis of the dermatologists of the world is that apricot St. Ives scrub that has these like sandy like pieces in it. It is just like pains me just to imagine them kind of ripping pieces of skin off microscopically. So we do not love physical exfoliation. You, you for the most part, do not need that. Um, it is okay to try to kind of like unclog the pores and get rid of dead skin cells with chemical exfoliation. And how do we do that? We do that with acids that we put on the skin in a controlled fashion. So it's important, again, look for the ingredient, choose the right product for your skin type. I'm going to give a few tips about that. And importantly, you only need to do this a couple times a week. So, you know, for the most part, it's not necessary unless you're having acne and need to use salicylic acid, you know, every day. Um, for the most part, you do not need to do this every night. I sort of tell people to think of this as a little spa treatment, you know, as, as on this calendar, maybe like twice a week, or maybe on the weekends, you give yourself a little spa treatment. Um, and here is just a list of, you know, what to look out for in terms of actual ingredients. Most important thing to know from this list is that Salicylic acid is the acid that penetrates the hair follicle. It is lipophilic, meaning it likes oil. And that's why so much salicylic acid is used in acne products. For the most part, if you don't have acne, you do not need salicylic acid. 
and can focus on one of the other acids. Um, glycolic acid is great, you know, it's gentle, it is great for um, pigment and skin tone and, um, uh, you know, generally well tolerated. If you're very dry or sensitive, some combination of this lactic acid and mandelic acid is great. Um, azelaic acid is a product that specifically targets dark spots or hyperpigmentation that come from maybe like old acne scars or melasma, which comes when, you know, women are pregnant um, or even nursing. And melasma can actually happen in men too, because it's the sun, not just hormones. So, um, you know, it sounds like you, everybody's going to have access to this information and, you know, knowing this list, like I said, the most important thing is to just know that salicylic acid is kind of like the strongest, most irritating because it does, you know, go deep into the hair follicle. CeraVe recently came out with this really nice product that I've been loving. It's a blend of glycolic and lactic acid. Um, so gentle, you know, um, really nice product that also has moisturizers in it. So, you know, you can still layer your moisturizer on over it if you're especially only using this like maybe twice a week. Um, but this is a lovely product, um, which at a totally reasonable price point um, that is, is accessible. Okay, and this is my last tip, um, you know, which we should probably all take a little bit of this advice, including myself. Um, you know, that the, the whole concept of, you know, that old saying, get your beauty sleep, um, there is some validity to that. And that is because in general, our entire body repairs itself while we are sleeping, our brain repairs itself while we are sleeping. So it makes sense that the skin would be doing that too. So if you're not getting enough sleep, you know, in general, your body is producing more stress hormones, which leads to more inflammation and more breakdown of the, you know, collagen and hyaluronic acid. That is what keeps our skin looking youthful. And, you know, there's definitely lots of data that shows that if you don't get enough sleep, you're going to have more dark circles. Dark circles are multifactorial and there's other causes as well. But we know that if you don't sleep enough, they're, they're you know, dark circles are going to look worse. So, you know, do what you can try to prioritize sleep. It, it, there really is science behind this. This is just to show you all that I do practice what I preach. Even my children practice what I preach. Um, and I couldn't find a picture of my husband who also has to wear rash guards now where he can't come on vacation with us. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's you know, I, do, I really do adhere to all of this. So thank you so much. I have to mention sunscreen one more time. Keep calm and wear your sunscreen. And I am happy to take some questions. Well, thank you very much. That was helpful. Again, just as informative, I still am taking notes. Um, there was, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, or um, I'll look at the chat. There was a question before in the chat about um, with the retinols, is, is that product mostly used for acne? Back when we were talking about things going on on the back or if... If sure, absolutely. So, so Adapalene, just like... Um, just like a just like retin A was made for acne, it is still produced for acne. It is just a prescription that if you don't have acne, you can tell your doctor, listen, I want to cash pay for this product. And so we write prescriptions and you know, your insurance won't pay for it if it's not for acne, but we use it for wrinkles, fine lines, skin rejuvenation. And adapalene is the same exact thing. Um, and that's why it's just so convenient that because it is a medicine for acne, um, it's now available just much more easily. And I think it's like 20 bucks, 30 bucks for a tube that, you know, will last a fair amount of time. And then if anybody else has any other questions that they would like, if you would want to unmute yourselves. I was curious when you were talking then again about um, you went through the different skin types and exfoliating. Is, mm -hmm. is there a difference of, um, again, back to getting to be a, a different age, not quite 
all the way there, but the skin, sure. you know, it, it, as, as, as you age, you know, going from, let's say an oilier skin or more normal sure. skin is, is there some sort of sensitivity that you should have once you kind of start creeping along? Let's put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So in my office, we don't talk about getting older, but we just talk about becoming more mature. So as we mature, um, you, you, you sort of, you, you do, you have to tinker with your regimen and, you know, depending on what your skin is tolerating at any given time. And, and sometimes also that changes seasonally. Some of my patients can't tolerate their retinoids, you know, in the winter as much and in the summer, they can use them a little bit more. Um, so you sort of balance that it is important to use if you can, um, a combination of ingredients. So, you know, wash your face twice a day in the morning, if you want to a vitamin C and then a sunscreen. I happen to like the tinted ones. And I even put a tinted sunscreen over my other sunscreen because I'm crazy. Um, at night you wash your face, you use a retinoid a couple nights a week, and then you moisturize with maybe a thicker, heavier moisturizer. What else do you add to that? Maybe exfoliate with one of the gentler acids glycolic or that CeraVe product, which um, has a little glycolic and a little lactic acid. Lactic acid is nice because it's also hydrophilic. It's moisturizing. It draws in a little bit of water. Um, so, you know, a, com a combination. And, and as your skin changes, you can say, listen, I used to be able to put my retinol or retinoid on three nights a week and also exfoliate once with glycolic acid. And now I can't do that anymore because ooh, it makes me, I'm sensitive or whatnot. So taper down. So use your retinol twice a week, use your glycolic acid once a week or once every other week, or maybe in the winter, you don't use your acid. You, you know, start that back up again, once it starts to get warmer and you sweat more and you know, whatnot, it's, it's okay for it to be a little bit fluid. Um, so it's nice to have a structure, um, and to have kind of like a core, you know, regimen that you kind of try to always sort of go back to. Um, but it, it, it's okay to be a little fluid. What I don't love is if my patients have sensitive skin and they're product junkies. So, um, you know, I like to talk about a lot of sort of like my favorite products, but um, I don't think it's necessary to always try the newest, latest and greatest thing. I think it's good that if you have something that's working for you, you sort of stick to a regimen. And if maybe one new product comes out that you've been seeing for a little while that you're going to swap out, right? For your glycolic acid wash is running out or your, you know, um, exfoliating serum is running out. Okay. Now I've been using glycolic. I'm going to use sort of similar ingredients, but a different product that I think I might like better and replace it and use it the same way. Um, and sort of slowly, you know, it takes 28 days for the skin, you know, to regenerate from, so it takes about a month to go from like your oldest skin to your newest skin every month that it regenerates itself. So it takes time. Um, of using a product and seeing how your, your skin is going to respond. Um, so th I think the key takeaway is to sort of be deliberate about, about what you're doing. And in general, you should be okay. Sure, maybe you try a new product and even one or two applications, whoa, this is too strong for me. Um, okay, so go back to your old regimen, wait, you know, wait for things to regenerate, wait for your skin to calm, sort of calm down, and then say, okay, I'm going to try something else now. Um, I am not a lover of kits just in general because, or, or systems, you know, um, they're great for, for teens who need something to adhere to maybe like proactive or whatever. Um, they're good ingredients, but, and, and maybe sometimes they help, you know, like a teen adhere to a system. But in general, if somebody comes to me with like huge new anti-aging regimen that they got sold at, you know, wherever they got it sold from, and they're all red. I'm like, okay, we got to get rid of all of this. Sort of start from scratch. You want to use these products? Fine. One at a time for two to four weeks at a time, sort of slowly work them in. Um, I think there's a sort of misconception that if you get a new system that has four steps and do it all at the same time, it's going to work faster. And it's not usually the case. Usually it's just going to be incredibly more irritating. And you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to take two steps back anyway. So I think just the same, the, 
like I was saying, the take home message is to, to be deliberate about the ingredients, you know, be educated about what is the active that I'm using, you know? Um, and that goes the same for like picking the sunscreen, you know, what is it that made me irritated? Okay. Maybe it was a chemical sunscreen. I'm going to try a mineral one next. Um, yeah. Hope I answered the question. I have a question. Um, <laughs> I am so easily, like, I was so happy to hear you um, talk about the CeraVe. Like, I'm so easily overwhelmed by, like, I recently spent like an hour walking around Bloomingdale's, mostly because I had a gift card and I didn't know what to buy. Uh -huh. But I, I don't know, how do you determine what your, like, how have you determined what your, like, favorite product is? Like, I, I'm just so overwhelmed by all the stuff on the market and then, like, the organic stuff and the all natural stuff. And like, I'm just so like, I was nice to hear about CeraVe and I used to see you a while ago. Um, and then I don't think I could get an appointment, but um, that was one of the things that you had said, like, so I've been sticking with CeraVe, like the AM PM moisturizer. Um, but I, I'm so easily overwhelmed thinking that like, you know, I should be like searching out other products, but I don't, sure. I, I don't even, you know, it's nice to see you mention some, I just don't know how you would decide, you know, what. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's incredibly overwhelming. And, um, there's, you know, there's so much out there and there's so much, so many gimmicks, there's so much information, um, which is, is sometimes hard to sift through. I think that, um, you know, I don't think for the most part that products need to be expensive to be good. I think that, um, so that's number one. So I think that when somebody tells me, oh, but you know, I love this SkinCeuticals cleanser that, you know, I know is like 45 bucks a bottle versus like the Neutrogena that's like 15. I'm like, great. If you love that cleanser and it's been working for you, great. Is it the one I straight out recommend? Not necessarily, because I think the Neutrogena cleanser is great. You know, the one that I tend to always recommend. I think your, your cleanser does not need to be expensive. I think CeraVe has great moisturizers. The AM and PM I love. Um, on occasion, if somebody needs something a little heavier, I have to move away from the CeraVe. Um, like La Roche-Posay has something called Lip Car, which is like a nice, heavy moisturizer that mature skin tends to love um, and is great to go on over the retinoid. Um, ultimately, you know, when, when you get into that, so, so I think it's good to have like the, those basics. This is what I always watch my face with. This is the sunscreen that I always put on to so like having that CeraVe AM and PM, great. And whatever cleanser you like to use. Um, so, you know, sort of, I know I'm a broken record, but um, the next thing to look at would be some sort of antioxidant in the morning. Um, it can, there's a spectrum of, you know, cost. I think being deliberate about the ingredient is what's important. And then trying one, use up the tube, see how it works for you. Um, if you're happy with it, keep going. And then at that point, it's time to add a retinoid at night, um, you know, and whether it be the $30 adapalene, great. If you wanna spend your gift card on an expensive moisturizer, you can do it and use up the moisturizer and sort of you know enjoy it while you're using it. But when you're done with it, it doesn't have to be your go-to product. You'd be like, that was great. Did it really like bring me so much joy or can I go back to my CeraVe? And um, if it didn't, you can go back to your CeraVe. Um, I think that I think that some of the gimmicks out there in terms of um, the clean and the natural and the you know I don't personally buy buy into that too much. I think that first of all the whole concept of natural. My favorite thing to tell people when they come to me saying that they want natural is to remind them that you know poison ivy is super duper natural. And none of us would want to go rub that all over our faces, you know, and it is nature. <laughs> um, so just because something, you know, is natural or it doesn't have chemicals in it that were created in the lab doesn't mean that it's intrinsically better for us. 
Um, now, are there preservatives in the products that we're using? Are there other chemicals in the products that we're using that you know, could potentially be harmful to us? Um, it's possible. It's possible. If so, we should never use soap, sunscreen, shampoo, forget about it. Um, sort of like it would be really impossible to like fully avoid chemicals and preservatives in our lives. This whole concept of parabens, for example, there is nothing wrong with parabens. What happened with parabens is that some people were allergic to them. The same way some people are allergic to poison ivy, but not everybody's allergic to poison ivy. Like I've touched it a lot of times and I've never gotten a rash. So what happened? So they took all the parabens and there's this like gimmick that like, well, this is paraben free, this is paraben free, this is paraben free. So turn the bottle over and you will see that what they replaced parabens with is something called methyl thiazolinone. Because if you don't have a preservative in the product, the bottle's gonna turn, you know, full of bacteria and fungus on your shelf <laughs> in your cabinet. So they have to replace it with something else. And so they took parabens out of everything. Now there's methyl thiazolinone in everything. And some people are, you know, a little bit allergic to methyl thiazolinone. I sort of think that, um, at least for me, it's not, you know, every, you know, people have their own um, opinions. Um, I think for me, that has not been something that's necessarily relevant unless we are going to avoid all commercially produced products. Does that sort of make sense? And I, I think that that makes it a little bit easier. Um, like even the all natural lines probably have something in there so that their you know, ingredients don't go moldy in the jar that they're giving you. Um, yeah, does that partially answer your question? Well, I found it helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I think the person who asked the question is back on mute. So I don't know if she's still there. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, the, the, the so that element I don't think is, um, and then I have a lot of people who do all natural and then they come in being like, I'm sort of interested in Botox, <laughs> you know, um, or they do all natural, but then they have a rash and then I have to give them a prescription strength topical steroid, you know, cream to cure their problem. And they end up having to use something that of course that medication is going to have preservatives in it. So, um, well, I think what you're saying too is, is, is probably the best to it, like a simple approach. Like if you want to experiment, like experiment a little at a time. Right. And then just kind of take it from there because um, everybody is so different and everybody's different at a different time. And, and again, like, you know, what, what worked before may not be working right now. Sure. And that's okay. <laughs> And the bottles are all little, so you will go through them quickly. Yeah, <laughs> like, nothing lasts forever with these little bottles. <laughs> right, right. Well, thank you very much. I I don't see anything other questions in the chat. Um, sure. I really do want to thank you for for taking the time to to really going through this with us. Um, as I said before to the group, I will send out uh, this recording. Uh, uh, I'll resend it. And that's why I kept saying in the beginning, because like I said, I've seen this before and I know like you go back and then you listen to something else. So, so it, you really covered a tremendous amount of, of, of great um, basic tips for us and things that we can incorporate. So with that, I think I'm going to, yep. Yeah, no, thank you. Everybody's thanking you in the- Excellent. Yes. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone else for coming too. And like I said, I'll send out the follow-up email. Okay, excellent. Bye now.